this is potentially going to be a chapter in my dissertation. So if people have comments or criticisms or anything that they can offer that they think would improve it or that needs more thinking, I would really appreciate those comments. I am returning to the Rupununi January to March of this year, specifically for a feedback and validation presentation trip with the indigenous people with whom I worked while I was there last year. So the better this can be before I get down there, the better it will be in the long run. So open to feedback, please. Um, to begin, I would just like to orient people to the area where the research took place. So this is a piece of South America. The dark, darker green is traditionally the Amazon area. So it's shared between quite a few countries. And the areas that I'm specifically going to be talking about today include Manaus, which is the largest city in the Amazon, Horaima, which is the northernmost state, and the capital is Bovista. And the third area is the Rupununi, which is the southern savanna region of Guyana. And it's mostly right on the border with Brazil. There are some inland areas as well. The Rupununi is where I spent the majority of last year conducting my field work. And I spent that time visiting five villages and speaking with over 100 people in conversation usually about migration between the two countries of Guyana and Brazil, focusing mostly on the impacts in the Rupununi. So Brazilian migration into Guyana isn't a new thing per se, and it has permeated all the way to the coast, up to Georgetown. But I was specifically focusing on the impacts in the indigenous villages of the Rupununi. So my presentation, I tried to do this in a few different ways. I couldn't get it to go in a linear format. So it's more of a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's more of a hierarchical format. So I'm beginning the presentation with some, an explanation of some of the key policies and legislation in Brazil introduced over the past few decades that I argue set the stage for and in some ways are causing the current events unfolding today in the Rupununi. I then, sorry, most of these policies argue for the increased defense of the Amazon territory, primarily through the promotion of colonization in the region. So following this, the presentation splits into three concurrent stories, and this is where it got confusing to go in a line. So the first one follows the role of small-scale mining in the Brazilian Amazon, which directly affected the Anamami people and had repercussions for the creation of their indigenous reserve, the Terra Indigena Yanomami. The second story follows the creation of commercial opportunities and encouragement for the new migrants into the Amazon, specifically business leaders and the economic importance of the Zona Franca of Manaus, which is a duty-free center in, the, in Manaus, right in the center of the Amazon. The third story follows new agricultural ventures in the north, specifically a conflict between rice producers and indigenous peoples in another indigenous reserve called the Haposa Serra do Sol, and the consequences that the creation of this new indigenous territory right on the border had for the general region. So I'll then try and connect these three stories with events unfolding in the Rupununi and trace the links that I see between Brazilian national legislation, including the eventual migration of three different groups of people from the three stories above, and the emerging outcomes in Guyana, specifically in the Rupununi. Finally, I explain how various migration patterns are impacting the peoples and the environments of the Rupununi, and I argue that these impacts can be seen as a direct result of the larger geopolitical concerns of the region specifically Brazilian development and defense policies. So the first part of the presentation is kind of boring, and I'm really sorry, but I don't know how else to present all of the background data <laughs> to make it interesting. This wasn't the research that I was conducting while I was down there. This is research that I've looked into since I returned because it seemed so directly relevant to me while I was down there that I figured that I had to go back and, and learn more about what was going on in the Amazon. So the first point that I'd like to discuss today is the military coup in 1964. So the civilian government transferred over to a military government. And this had serious repercussions, obviously, in the country, but specifically in the Amazon. 
because the shift from focus went strongly onto the idea of defending the Northern Territory from the, the border states, specifically Brazil, specifically Gu- Venezuela, and Guyana was the other one because of the Marxist government that was emerging. Their first program that they implemented, the military government, was the Operação Amazonia. And it was aimed at developing the region specifically by increasing the Amazonian population, securing the frontier, and exploiting natural resources. That was their mandate. It included the beginning of road development, the first one being the Road of the Jaguar, which went from Belém to Brasilia. And this was the first land connection into the region. There were also several other roads initiated during this time period that linked the south of the country to the north. Importantly, it included the reforming of a superintendency that had previously been known as the Superintendency of Economic Recovery into the Superintendency of Development of the Amazon. The acronym for that one is SUDEM. And one of SUDEM's most important programs was the creation of the free trade zone, the Zona Franca de Manaus. This duty-free zone in part worked because Brazil had artificially high taxes and tariffs throughout the country, and the creation of the zone encouraged business and manufacturers to locate specifically in Manaus. Additionally, the previous bank of rubber tappers or rubber producers, the Banco de Crédito de Borracha, was converted into an Amazon region development bank to fund development projects specifically in the Amazon area. And this created financial and administrative structures that continue to impact today. Because of these strategic developments, investors rushed into the Amazon, as did many laborers and squatters, attracted by work on the new roads and the possibility of a new start in life with the government's blessing. Out of this, the National Integration Plan was born. The intent of this plan was to shift Amazonian land occupation from an economic to a social perspective. Therefore, agricultural migrants were targeted throughout the country as they believed that ample farmland could be made available to those who were willing to clear the land and farm. Within the country, nationally, the southern agricultural region had recently mechanized and this had left several farmers displaced by machinery. In the northeast of the country, they were facing yet again another severe drought, and this caused large-scale suffering in that region. The Amazon was seen as a land without people for a people without lands, and that's a really famous quote that came out of that era. The Trans-Amazonia Highway, which runs east-west, just about 100 kilometers south of one of the Amazon's major tributaries, linked the coast around San Luis, linked it through various towns that had previously only been accessible by river into Porto Velho, which is the capital of one of the larger western Amazonian states, and then onwards through Acre, which is the westernmost state, right up almost to the Peruvian border. And along this road, large-scale migration followed, and this was one of the largest migration movements that the Brazilian Amazon saw during this era. The PIN was, in addition, also further accompanied by large lines of credit for investment into Amazonia, and this helped further the push to populate the north. In 1975, the Brazilian government paid for a survey of the region by aircrafts equipped with the SLR side-looking aerial radar throughout the Amazon region. This Haram Brazil project located large mineral deposits including tin, iron, bauxite, gold, and diamonds. A gold rush began in the eastern reaches of the Amazon, but as gold was discovered in other regions in the Amazon, it was found that the small-scale miners, who are locally known as Garimperos, easily shifted around the area. In addition, the failed agricultural migrants, because of course the soil wasn't as productive as they thought it was going to be, from the early colonization projects, easily shifted into small-scale mining, vastly increasing the numbers of garimperos in the region. First, cassiterite, then gold, were discovered in Horaima, prompting a large movement of garimperos into specifically that northern region. 
Full Amazonia was the next policy introduced, and this was seen as a refinement of the Operação Amazonia. And this policy envisioned the region segmented into 15 development poles to, of exploitation, where infrastructure and investment would be concentrated. Around half of Horaima was targeted as one of these 15 poles. The National Institution for Colonization and Agrarian Reform, known as INCRA, and the Secretary of Agriculture of Horaima together worked on a project designed to penetrate hinterland territory for the specific purposes of natural resource development in the far north. The four goals included the very familiar support of construction of roads and associated colonization projects, the development of the ranching sector and agricultural projects, the researching of mineral resources, and the new one to expand trade with Guyana. Things carried on for some time with this push for development, and then in the 1980s, the environmental movement began gathering force internationally. With the, term, with the return to democracy, the new president had to respond to increasing international challenges about the health of Amazonian forests, and so Nossa Natureza was implemented as a specifically environmental policy for the region, although it is commonly recognized solely as a continuation of frontier defense because at this time they were responding to the threats of internationalization of the Amazon. Now by this I mean that there were some American and European politicians who had been condemning Brazil's management of the forests, especially in light of heavy forest fires in the previous few years, as well as concerns about cattle ranching and the associated deforestation, which I think most people today are very familiar with. Nossa Natureza countered these claims with very strong nationalistic language stressing that the nation of Brazil would not welcome challenges to their sovereignty over the Amazon. This was the first time that an Amazonian plan did not feature roads, development, infrastructure, or migration. However, this was short-lived. And in 1986, the Calle Norte program was introduced. This was the first Amazon development policy produced by the civilian government However, it's important to note that while it's a civilian government, it's very much so a military plan implemented by the Brazilian military and in a large part committed to a large military presence in the region, again for the purposes of defense of the frontier and the newly emerging threat of internationalization of the Amazon. Contradictorily, in light of the fact that this was a democracy, the plan was created almost completely in secrecy under the aegis of national security, hardly the transparency you would assume in, an, in a new democracy. The Calle Norte included five key objectives. Again, some of them are quite familiar. To increase bilateral relations to combat drug traffic and to reinforce international road networks, to increase military presence in the area, to improve and establish frontier markers, to increase highway construction, accelerate the production of hydroelectric power, to integrate the development poles, and to increase social services, and to define an Indian policy appropriate for the area. So that's the language of the policy, which I've retained for the purposes of this presentation, because the translation in Portuguese, that's the word they use. Obviously, it's not the word we use. Um, I think that's enough history for now, and I hope that from this, you can see that the key policies and legislation that were introduced in the Amazon were mostly specifically focused on, mil on a military perspective, with colonization, resource exploitation, and fr frontier defense as the primary objectives. So let's shift to one of the first, to one of the case studies. The first being the indigenous reserve of the Yanomami. This reserve is located in the northwest of Horaima, as you can see in the very tiny map. So it doesn't border on Guyana. Until the 1970s, most anthropologists and most literature agreed that the Yanomami were essentially an uncontacted group living on the Venezuelan-Brazilian border. By uncontacted, they didn't mean that they had no influence whatsoever, but that the most of the people in the region had not had face-to-face -face contact, social contact, cultural contact with a European population in the region. In 1974, the northern perimeter highway was begun, 
This is known as the Highway to Nowhere, and it was seen as a military defense of the frontier area. They couldn't complete it. They ran out of money, is basically the reason why, and probably popular support. This was a military effort to patrol the Brazilian frontier. It cut through the territory, as you can see just in the bottom of the yellow portion. It says perimeter highway. It cut through the territory, and several Yanomami were introduced to European disease, as well as violence from road builders, which caused dramatic decreases in their numbers. After much conflict, FUNAI, the Brazilian indigenous agency, recognized the Yanomami territory. However, it was right around the same time that the Hadam Brasil project located vast mineral deposits in northern Horaima, including tin, iron, gold, and diamonds. In 1967, a real gold rush was begun, and soon reports of anywhere from between 30,000 to 100,000 garimperos were in Yanomami territory, although the most common number cited is 40,000. And just to give a perspective, most people believe that the number of Yanomami was approximately 10,000 at the time, so it's four times the number of indigenous people. The agriculture... Agricultural migrants and garimperos could easily access the area due to the newly constructed roads, and the price of gold had skyrocketed, and Brazil was desperate for foreign currency to service their nearing 100 billion US dollar debt, and they saw resource exploitation as a particularly good method for servicing this debt. So just to return briefly to national policy, we see that in response to this garimpero invasion, again with a new government that came into Brazil at the time, that in response to both national and international pressure, pressure President Collar ordered the removal of the Garimperos from the Yanomami territory, as well as the systematic destruction of their illegal airstrips and all machinery found. After several failed attempts, this finally broke the investment system, more or less, and many Garimperos left the territory, although it seems that approximately nine or 10,000 have never left or it's a revolving door and there's always around that number in the area. In 1992, the indigenous reserve was officially demarcated. Unfortunately, there are still reported violent clashes between the remaining Garimperos and the Yanomami. What I'm arguing, this is where my argument comes in, is that this expulsion of anywhere from between 90,000 to 20,000 Garimperos from Yanomami territory in part caused an increase in migration activity across the Guyanese-Brazilian border, both in number of minors and in the intensity of migration. So I'm going to now introduce some of my own field work. I just wanted to make a note that Guyana uh, speaks English, but they use a Caribbean dialect. And so the quotes I'm presenting restrains, retains the structure of the language, and I will be reading them out. But if people have any trouble with what's being said, because sometimes it's a bit different than what, how we would say it, just ask me and I can try and interpret as best I can. So mining had been going on in the South Rio Panuni for approximately 100 years. However, local populations are noting that Brazilian incre Brazilians were increasingly mining within Guyanese territory. So this, this man is saying, oh, what's happening now is more Brazilians are coming. They're going to the mines. That's what you're seeing, that thing. The Brazilians, they take over in town and they're coming here to take over mining. And this lady who says, a lot of Brazilians in Guyana, plenty. Brazilians working in the gold mines. Yeah, it wasn't like that before, but right now there are plenty of gold miners, Brazilians. This next Wapshanaman has indicated that he first started noting an intensity of activity approximately 15 years ago, including the introduction of dredges to the South Rupununi. He says, Marudi, now Marudi is the largest mining area in the south of Guyana, was a mining area for like, since before I was born. And you, it took like, just like, just like in the last 15, 12, 15 years that a dredge started coming in there to operate and it caught on too. This almost exactly correlates with the expulsion of miners from the Yanomami territory. And I spoke with the Brazilian consul in Lethem and even he readily admits that Brazilians are entering Guyana, specifically for mining purposes. And I think it's interesting that there's a presence of a Brazilian consulate in this tiny, anybody who knows Guyana, Latham is small, and they have a Brazilian consulate. I think this is an indication as well as the increasing importance of Brazilian migration into the region. So to move on to the second story, 
and remembering that one of the key objectives of the Kaya Norch program was to increase bilateral relations, combat drug traffic, and reinforce international road networks. The second story looks at the opening of the Takati River Bridge. So this is a photo of the bridge under construction. Just took them 10 years to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and they did it. It's open. <laughs> so this is what it looks like today. I think it's really important to note that it's hard to see, but at the bottom of the sign, the military government of Brazil is who built the bridge as part of the Kaya Norch program. So remembering again that Guyana is an English-speaking nation, let's look at some photos from around Latham Town. Pretty quickly, you can notice that most of the shop signages in Portuguese are a reflection of the increasing foreign ownership of commercial businesses in Latham. The shops sell a variety of goods, including clothes, shoes, and electronic goods, and there are also several Brazilian restaurants catering to the Brazilian population. While some of the buildings have been around for some time, it's obvious that many are newly constructed, reflecting growing investment in the town. And not only are the shops owned by Brazilians, but they're catering for Brazilian shoppers. Lots of them. This opening of the Takatu River Bridge is the latest piece of the Zona Franca to Manaus story, remembering that Manaus was created as a duty-free zone to encourage business and investment and to support migration within the region. Today, Brazilian business owners purchase goods duty-free in Manaus, transport them to Lethem, which is outside of Brazilian territory, and resell the goods, usually to Brazilians from Roraima. So again, the Brazilian consul is the first quote I have, and he was trying to speak with me in English at this point in the interview, so it's, uh, it's awkward, but I think you'll, you'll get what he's trying to say. Manaus, it's very, very populated because the Franca, the Zona Franca of Manaus, and after they open the bridge, the citizens of Brazil and Guyana implement the business, implement the person. This connection is also well known to local residents, as this Wapshana man states. Yeah, and most of the business people deal direct from Manaus. Yeah, so the goods come from Manaus. And you find the Brazilians from Boa Vista now coming and buy from here because driving from Boa Vista to here is near than to go to Manaus. And just to give you an idea of the distances being spoken about, Manaus is located, no, Boa Vista is located here. Manaus is here. And Lethem is here. And you have to remember that most of these roads are running through the Amazon yeah, rainforest and the roads aren't particularly good. The travel time between Bovista and Manaus right when I last did the trip was about 18 hours and between Bovista and Lethem it's about an hour and a half. The road between Bovista and Manaus in particular is deteriorating because of the severe flooding they've had over the past few years. So here, once again, you see a link that traces the increasing number of Brazilians and Brazilian businesses directly to the opening of the bridge, with this Mokushi man saying, yeah, they say before, right, it was not like that. But after the leaders of the countries decide to agreement, Brazil government and Guyana government, that is, I think is, I can't remember is how much, I think is about two years or three years from such agreement, but from since then you have a lot of Brazilians coming in here. The two to three years he indicates would be the difference in year between the opening of the bridge in 2009 and the year of the interview, which was this year, 2012. And all across the Rufa Nuni, we see residents noting this increase of Brazilians in Lethem and often linking the increase to the opening of the bridge. So this woman who says, right, but I noticed that since the bridge opened, a lot of business has boomed in Lethem. You see these massive places going up, going up, going up. And this man who says, the road with the bridge, well, you have a lot of Brazilians already in Lethem, right? So Lethem is like a Brazilian port. And this woman who says, they are saying that Lethem is like Brazil. Yeah, they're speaking Portuguese. All people down there, she can't speak English, but people still buying from she. And this man who says, so bridge is open, and we're really getting Brazilians coming in, you know, in a flood. So now we're going to turn to the final part, the final story. And in doing so, we're going to turn to the middle part that was left out of that first screen. In 1977, Funai legally identified the Raposa Serra do Sol, which is located in the northeast of the state of Horaima, this time on the border of Guyana, but also of Venezuela, as again you can see in that teeny tiny map. 
So in between these two operations, in 1998, the Haposa Cerro de Sol was declared an indigenous territory. However, in 2005, Ajoceros, who are rice producers, non-indigenous rice producers in the reserve, contested the declaration. In 2009, however, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Haposa Cerro de Sol. So during almost the 40 years of conflict that emerged from the, the declaration of this territory, hundreds of people were killed, including 21 indigenous leaders of the area who were assassinated by either the rice producers or by hired killers. Kidnappings were common, dynamite and car bombs were strategies used by the farmers, and land invaders regularly burned homes and fields. Problematically, the government of Horaima supported the rice producers, and together they filled the injunction against the demarcation in 2005, arguing, are you ready for it, that the reserve was a threat to national sovereignty, defend, uh, to the national defense policy, and then in creating the reserve, economic development of the state would collapse. Sounding very familiar. Furthermore, while many of the rice producers had been in the area for some time, many also came to the reserve upon its declaration, hoping to receive compensation from the government for their loss of lands, because this was a very regular occurrence that when indigenous territories were declared, the people who had land in those areas would either be given money or land in another place. So we see here how the historical military policy and legislation intensified the conflict in the Haposa Serra de Sol. Now how does this impact Guyana? While many people in the Rupununi are talking about a large piece of land in the north Rupununi, Many people have seen signs posted on the land indicating that it's been leased or purchased or in some other way been removed for public use with no trespassing signs posted. This piece of land is across the river from the Haposa Serra de Sol and would have very similar qualities in terms of soil and fertility. Many residents believe that this land has been leased by the same rice farmers who were expelled from the Haposa Serra de Sol with the approval of the government, as is Wapishana Women states. There is this big Brazilian rice farming people that want to come and do farming in the wetlands of the north, and approval by the Guyana government has been approved. Yes. This community leader, the next quote, traces this land purchase to the events across the border, stating, yeah, that was some of those chaps, I think they come from that side. I think they were the ones who were thrown out of Brazil. They were, these farmers were farmers farming across in Brazil. I think you should know the story of the, it was a long battle with the indigenous people over there. These farmers, well, the farmer eventually lost. And they meet too after that, they approached the government of Guyana for, and that's how this project came about, I think so. This next woman is a Makushi woman who lived in Brazil during the conflict in Haposa Serra de Sol. And she expresses shock that these same rice farmers could come to Guyana to farm on indigenous territory. And the same man who's doing the rice plantation is one of them who the indigenous people put out from the same thing here. Yes, he is one of them. It is he that killed the indigenous leader. And when he told me this, I said, is he coming in here? However, the North Rupununi District Development Board, which is one of the larger development organizations in the North, has been campaigning against this possibility. And the president of that organization doesn't believe the sale or lease of land will be permitted. He states, well, I don't think it's going to go through. People in the Rupununi is very concerned about any large-scale agricultural development because traditionally this is a flooded area, right? And if you do big rice farming here, it's going to affect every single person in the Rupununi. So when I return to Guyana this year, I'm hoping to find out more about where this land deal stands, including perhaps speaking to people in Georgetown because last year I didn't plan for any time in Georgetown. So now I'd like to discuss how some of the impacts of these Brazilian migrations, what the impacts are in the Rupununi on the peoples. So I'm going to be looking at both the social and the environmental impacts in the three regions. So to begin, the social impacts in the South Rupununi, which was the mining area, include increased drug and alcohol use, increased prostitution, STIs, and malaria. The malaria is increasing because the stagnant water left behind by the dredges is an ideal mosquito breeding ground and increased violence within the communities. So this man who lives just outside of the primary mining area but in the direct influence of Meridi states that I think the outsiders that are coming in for me have been just too, just too fast, right? 
If you look at Parabera as an example, literally overnight that community place became a mining village from a very quiet community you would see who relied on their farms and lived that quiet life, overnight became a community that went with alcohol and all other things too. So the environmental consequences of the mining in the south include land and water degradation, mercury pollution. Mercury is used to extract gold from alluvial soils and waters. And the reduction of game and fish availability. The game is decreased because of the, mostly because of the noise and disturbance of increased mining activities, including machines. And the fish are reduced mostly because of the turbidity of the water. So this woman states, it will, it will come through, right through, as pollution will come. Because we had the experience last year, the fishes were dying all through the river. They don't know what happened to the fishes, but when they get to find out, it was from the Maruti Mountain. So we are really worried about all these things that are happening in the future. So shifting to the central area, primarily Latham, the social impacts include increased violence and crime, increased smuggling, including drugs, but it's not just drugs, it's also all the things that they're trading across the border, and a loss of traditional life ways because people are shifting to a service economy. And this man says, right, so there's an increase in crime, theft, murders, these revelings and fightings and all these things, it's increased, unfortunately. And that was foreseen. I've foreseen that coming long. I mean, it's obvious that that would happen. So the environmental impacts in the business area include increased traffic and decreased safety, primarily because the people of Brazil drive on the right and the people in Guyana drive on the left. So with the opening of the bridge, there was a large increase in numbers of cars from Brazil driving in Latham and the traffic has got quite chaotic with several people driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> There's also large increases in litter to avoid customs and duty and increased pressure on the infrastructure, so the water and also the electricity because most of it's still diesel operated down there, generators. So this, this man says, like, for example, they cannot take back X amount, right? So if they buy something in box or bags, they take all the product alone and just dispose the bags and boxes on the road. You know, that's what people see them doing. So finally to the south, and although the rice farming hasn't begun as yet, there were still quite a few people concerned about the potential impact such a venture would have on the local populations and environments. So the social impacts here include a reliance on wage labor, which could potentially lead to a loss of traditional culture. And interestingly, the loss of rights to future land claims, because in particular, Makushi people are still negotiating their land claims, and the sale or lease of land within the territory could have important consequences for the future. So this man says, it will have a social impact because the people now won't be able to go out and practice their fishing skills. All the areas, because they know certain areas, there's a whole set of knowledge that will be taken away by that. And the environmental impacts of the potential rice farming include possible poisoning of two major watersheds. This is because during flooding, the Amazon River system meets the Essequibo River system, and they join exactly where they're proposing to put this rice farming. It's the worst possible place they could put it. <laughs> um, the large increase, oh sorry, the potential wetland disturbance, including birds and other migratory animals, and the potential loss of habitat for the threatened arapaima. And as this man states, because of the ecosystem that we have, is wetlands and you're going to do rice farming, the chemicals that you will be using can get in the waterways. It will affect the fishes, the wildlife, the birds, everything else. You know, that's our fear. So to recap, I hope that I've presented the story in three parts with the history, which was boring, but then how it impacted the three different areas in Brazil and how those three different events had migration repercussions in three different areas in Guyana, which then, of course, had both social and environmental impacts in the region. And I didn't realize that my title was clever until someone pointed it out to me, so I'm going to capitalize on that and say that people changing places, in fact, is changing places. So I'd like to thank the people in the Rukununi who took the time to speak with me, especially the people in the villages of Shulanab, Aishalton, St. Ignatius, Karasabai, and Anai District, as well as the North Rukununi District Development Board, the South Central People's Development, or 
Association, which are the two main development organizations in the region, and the District Two House Council, which is the Council of Community Leaders in the South. And I'd also like to thank WISIS for their generous contribution to my research. That's all. <laughs>